Progressive brings you Flowetry with Flow. When Flow flows, she flows in the know. Mind ruminates the rates. Shown them all, I heed the call. Seeing the rest, I choose the best. Sometimes it's ours, sometimes it's not. When the fox walks, is it called a fox trot? That's a real question. Compare Progressive Direct rates with competitors' rates. Visit Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. On this special episode of Movie Geeks United to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the 1987 film uh, Dragnet, we welcome actor Jack O'Halloran, who played the villain Emo Muzz in the film. Mr. O'Halloran is a former heavyweight boxer turned actor who also had memorable roles in such films as Superman 1 and 2, King Kong, the 1976 remake, which also starred Jeff Bridges and Jessica Lange, The Flintstones, and he's also guest starred in such classic television series as Cannon, Hunter, Knight Rider, and Murder, She Wrote. It's an honor to have you on our show, and thanks for joining us. My pleasure, indeed. Yes, uh, I was just, and by the way, before we get started here, I wanted to say I was just speaking with one of your former uh, colleagues, um, Eddie Deason, the other night, and he said to oh. tell you hello. Uh, you, he said you guys worked together on Mob Boss and had seen very little of each other and said to be sure and tell you hello. So I'm just relaying a message there. <laughs> yeah, tell him hello if you talk back to him. I will, I will. Guy. Yeah. We're going to be talking with him uh, very soon, uh, next next week actually. So uh, that's yeah. But okay. uh, anyway, uh, I was going to say, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, if you don't mind, and uh, how you made the transition from boxing to acting. You know, I, it's amazing. They they came to me um, several times to do films, and um, the first time I guess was uh, in in Boston when I just started boxing. Um, Steve McQueen did a picture called The Thomas Crown Affair. And mm-hmm. uh, when he came to Boston, we looked after him, uh, and he and I became pretty good friends, and uh, and he wanted me to come down and get in the movie. He said, you know, you got to come to Hollywood. You come down on the set, I'll get you a card. And we'll put you in this film and, and come out to Hollywood, and we'll have a good time. And um, I just I passed. And he was really kind of disturbed. I said, you know, I don't think I, I said, you know, I've got a, a career that I'm embarking on. And I was undefeated as a heavyweight. And and I, I wasn't ready for the film industry, I guess. So I, then we went down the street and um, he um, did a picture called uh, Towering Inferno and called me on the phone and said, how do you like your name up on the screen? Because his name in the picture was Captain O'Halloran. And uh, and we've joked about it. And you got to come to Hollywood. You got to come to Hollywood. In 1968, I had a I boxed a, a a guy by the name of Manuel Ramos in Los Angeles, and he was ranked number two in the world at the time. And I knocked him out. And uh, they came to me to do the Great White Hope, which was the biggest picture in Hollywood at the time. And um, they put together a deal, Eddie Foy the third. Eddie Foy the third had a broker to deal with some friends, and uh, and they flew me out, and I met the producer, and all I had to do was sign the contract. And they were going to go to Spain for six months and shoot this picture with James Earl Jones and and, and a host of people. And um, and when I I came out, I sat and talked to the producer, and and I thought about it, and I said, you know. You you want me to go to Spain for six months? I just knocked out the number two heavyweight in the world, and you want me to give up boxing and go to do a film in Spain? And uh, <laughs> I don't think that. Uh, and I said, you're going to pay me how much money? And he said, I don't know, something like fifteen hundred a week or something. I I said, well, which I guess in sixty sixty eight was a lot of money. And I uh, and I said, I give that away in tips a week. I said, so you're not you're not paying me anything really. And you want me to give up, you know, a shot at the title. And so I turned them down, and they were livid. They couldn't believe that I said no, because it was the biggest picture in Hollywood. And I said, there's a guy up in Minnesota, Jim Beatty, who just retired from boxing. He's a big, tall, white boy, and he's a nice kid and has a lot of mouths to feed. He probably needs a job. Give him a call. And the guy said, you're selling no to me? I said, 
Well, I guess I guess so. And he said, this was the deal was supposed to be all done. I said, well, you know, I, I don't think I think I pass. And uh, God, Eddie Foy was so upset. Oh my God, you're going to get us in trouble with this deal was all put together to get you. You know, I say, well, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And I was leaving the building, and then James Earl Jones was coming in the building, and he stopped me and he said. Uh, Jack O'Halloran, I said, James Earl Jones, he said, is it true what I just heard about you? I said, I don't know, it depends on what you heard. He said, you just turned to Hollywood to take the biggest picture they're doing and, and to shove it, forget about it. And I said, well, and if you want to look at it that way, I guess. He said, i got to shake your hand. I never knew anybody that, that told Hollywood to forget about it. <laughs> and we became friends from then on. And, and then McQueen called me on the phone. He said, are you crazy? What's the matter with you? Uh, but what do we got to do to get you out of here? So I, anyway, and I went on, and, and then I retired from boxing in um, in '74. In '75, they called me to do um, a picture with Robert Mitchum called "Farewell, My Lovely." Mm -hmm. uh, an agent I had in San Diego. I did a lot of commercials when I was boxing. I was a California heavyweight champion, so I represented Royal Crown Coal and several other things, and. Um, she said, they want you to do a movie called Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum, and I think you should do it. And I said, okay, well, what do I got to do? And I looked around, and I just it was time. So I went up to New York, and I met the director, and he said, you're it? You're the guy? Blah, blah, blah. And I thought he was pulling my leg. And I said, yeah, okay, right. He said, no, 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 I'm telling you, you're the guy. So I went, a couple of days later, they flew me out to Hollywood. I did a screen test, and Robert Mitchum said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. And and I blame it all on Robert Mitchum. And Farewell, My Lovely is an excellent movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you haven't, you should. It's a classic. and It's a, a Raymond Chandler deal, and, and it worked extremely well. And I probably could have, I probably would have been nominated for supporting actor that year. Uh, Mitchum had arranged for me to do the Johnny Carson show. And uh, I went to meet Johnny Carson and, uh, at the mm -hmm. Polo Lounge, and he he um, he said, "You come on my show, I'll get you nominated for the Oscars." And I said, "Wow!" I said, "You know," uh, I said, "But your show is live, isn't it?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Well," I said, "I don't think I could do your show." He said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Well, you're going to ask me about my father, and I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at." He said, "You would get up and leave?" I said, "Yeah," because I wouldn't allow anyone to talk about my father. And I said, so I, you know, he said, wow, I don't believe. He said, well, we'll, we'll readjust the questions. We won't, we won't speak about him. I said, <laughs> I said, you know, not to say anything, but you know, you, you, you have Albert Anastasia's son on the stage and you're not going to ask him about my father when he's the most notorious guy ever come in the country. And, and he, and you're the the biggest reporter in the country. I said, I, I, I don't think that'll play too well. So it um, I turned him down, and, and I probably cost myself uh, a nomination. But, you know, there was uh, Mitchum called me up. He said, are you crazy? What is the matter with you? This is Hollywood. Who cares where you come from? <laughs> oh, you know, and I just uh, said, and I regret doing that because I just, but, you know, I had just come out here, and I come off the streets back east, and I just, I don't know, I just was really kind of protective of where I came from. So, um, But then my career went on. I did King Kong and, and, and several films after that, and, and the Superman movies came up, and mm -hmm. um, and things worked out very well. And Dragnet was a lot of fun. I mean, we we had a ball doing it. I mean, Hanks and, uh, and Aykroyd are, were great to work with, um, as was everyone in the picture. It was a well-casted movie. Uh, it was well done. And and it turned out very well. Tom Mankiewicz was a friend because we did Superman together. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know it was it was an easy choice to to do it, and and I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, I I was going to ask you about the Mankiewicz uh, connection because I figured you guys might have known each other fairly well since you'd worked together more than once. And uh, I always was a fan of his uh, of his screenwriting. You know, he contributed some some excellent screenplays for the. Uh, the James Bond franchise, um, I thought it was, uh, especially Diamonds Are Forever. I, I always enjoyed his work on that. And, 
Yeah, but I, I, I rewatched Dragnet last night, and it, it it still holds up. It's still funny, and you're you're great in it, of course. And, you know, uh, <laughs> Dragnet's one of those movies that you could watch 50 times and mm-hmm. still not hear all the one-liners that Danny Aykroyd put out. I mean, he was... <laughs> He was brilliant. He, there were so many one-liners in that movie that were just absolutely hysterical. I mean, it was just just a lot of funny lines in the movie, and it just uh, and it worked well. And it, of course, it was it was Tom Hanks' big breakthrough. Um, you know, and, they, uh, it, it, and Danny was Danny was you know Danny Aykroyd. He was he 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 studied Jack Webb right to the letters, boy, and I yes. thought he did a great job. Yes, he's perfect. He's he's note perfect, and I and I was gonna ask you if he improvised or if that or if those lines were scripted or if it was in the original shooting script because I've never had a, a chance to read the original shooting script to see if it was actually scripted or if he or if he made some of that up on the fly, which he possibly could have since he was known to improvise. He, he made a lot of, and he was like that, but he, he had an earplug in his ear all the time because he was listening to Jack uh-huh. Webb all the time, and he was so he got him down pretty well. You know, with the conversation and stuff, but uh, Danny was a great ad libber. I mean, he's a he's a great actor. He's a great comedian, um, and a very talented guy, and just a a really nice person. Yeah, he's. Uh, he, I th- I think that's one of his finest achievements as far as uh, his career as an actor post Saturday Night Live. I think he just really. Like you said, he really nails it and uh, and nails the, the, the perfect cadences of Jack Webb. And uh, I, I love all the references, and they brought back Harry Morgan, you know, from the, uh, from, from the television Oh, God, show. what a sweetheart. I tell you, poor Harry. Harry had such Alzheimer's disease that we lost him one night. <laughs> wow. We were, we, were doing the, we were doing the scene in, uh, in, the, in the restaurant when, mm-hmm. uh, when you know, when, when – when uh, they they go over to expose uh, the preacher, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the villain, and uh, and and Harry, Harry, we 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 turned around and we, they couldn't find him for for almost an hour. <laughs> he wandered off. He was oh, it was funny. It's, it's, poor Harry. He's a, he was such a such a nice nice man, boy. And you know he was a great actor in his day, but he he was suffering from Alzheimer's when we did that film, and mm-hmm. so he was a little bit. Tedious for some people once in a while, but um, but he was just a, he was just such a such a gentle soul, you know. God bless him. Yeah, he he uh, you you never would have known it. He masks it so well, you know. His performance is just it's almost like they just picked right up from the television show, so you wouldn't. Oh know yeah, him. he was brilliant. He just you're right, just like he he was great. I mean, it's a, he he was just like he was on TV. Is correct. Yeah, it was a. Uh, I, I thought I really thought the movie was well done. I, I you know, I uh, it did well, thank God, you know, for the for the producers and all. But it was uh, it was, and you're right, it's one of Danny's better pieces. Yeah, it's uh, and I would have liked to have seen a sequel to it. I'm I'm really sorry that they didn't kind of capitalize on that when it. You know, uh, the you know when the when the striking while the iron was hot, I guess you would say, <laughs> because uh, yeah, I, kept I think hoping. They, I think they talked about it, but I, I don't know why they didn't do it. Actually, you're right; they should have. Yeah, because it would have been it's it's perfect for uh, sequelization. It lends itself. I mean, it's one of those things you could just have any number of uh, adventures, you know, continuing adventures with those characters. So it would have been a it, it would have been great. But and and I like a lot. Uh, another thing I enjoy about it is is uh, that it captures Los Angeles in the late '80s. You know, which is kind of. So it's changed so much since then. I, I try. I get out there every once in a while, and it's just changed so much since the late '80s. And uh, it 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 really you know, it's a moment frozen in time, and that's that's kind of interesting when you go back. Well, the and funny visited. part is, you know, where they where they shot the mansion, you I, know, the, I the, had... uh, where they shot like the Playboy Mansion deal, where all the girls and all that stuff. Right. That property is a convent. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that I actually had a lot of nuns. They had a lot of nuns living there. Was it belonged to the church? <laughs> Great piece of property. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure they. I'd like to know what they really thought about that, but I guess sometimes you. 
<laughs> well, they got paid very well for it, so uh, I, I guess nobody said nothing. You know? <laughs> true. Very true. But, uh, yeah, it it does – the movie does hold up so well, and everybody is uh, really, really great in it. And I just uh, – like I said, I wanted to commend, commend you for your, uh, for your performance in there because, like I said, you're the perfect – uh, villain to their to, to your perfect counterpart to them. So uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about some other films if you didn't mind uh, while I have oh. you here. Uh, several things I just wanted to see if, the, if you hear rumors, but you're not sure if they're true or not. One was about the spy who loved me. I had heard that uh, you were originally in the uh, that they were thinking about casting you as Mr. Jaws. Well, they came they, to Hollywood to get me. They really they, they exerted themselves. Uh, Cubby and his son came and uh, sat at my agent's office for a couple of hours, actually. And uh, I had already I, I had signed to do a picture called March or Die, and um, and I really didn't like the script. You know, I, I didn't like the character. Uh, I didn't want to get caught in the mold of playing just a, a big, dumb guy. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. um, I felt that I had better skills than that. And um, so I didn't, you know, and I discussed it with Mitchum, and, and he said, if you don't like it, don't do it. So I um, I passed, you know, and, and Richard Keel got the picture, and I, I think I turned down six different movies, and Richard did them all, and that made his career. God bless him. You know, yeah, he was, uh, and and he was a very lovely guy too. I I met him several years. In fact, the yeah, year Richard he was a away. nice fellow. He really was. He was, uh, yeah. You know. He was uh, when I I met him the year he passed away. Actually, six months before he passed, and uh, he was just my son is a big James Bond fan, and it just made his day to uh, to 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 be able to meet him. And it just uh, yeah, he was so so kind and such a kind heart. So uh, yeah, well, it was kind I, of you know. By passing on it, I got to do Superman. So I just I think Superman was a better a better character. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, you, and, it, and it certainly works well. And that was my next question because I've always heard that it was your idea for Non to be mute, and I didn't know if that was just a rumor or if it was true. Well, so we, we discussed it. You know, Donner. Don, when I went to meet Donner. Um, we discussed it, and, and I and I said, hey, "Would you have a problem?" And I said, "No." I said, "I in fact, I'm I, I employ doing it that way." And he said, "Why?" I said, "Because Jackie Gleason did a film called Gigo, mm-hmm. where he won an Oscar for being a deaf dumb mute." And I said, "If I ever got a part where I could play and do uh, facial and body language expression, I would grab it in a heartbeat." Because it's uh, and and you know, when you look at Superman, I mean, Terrence was a vicious general, Sarah was a man eater, so somebody had to relate to the children, to the younger audience. So taking a character like Nan, being this huge, ferocious guy, and doing it like a child, learning how to walk and talk, and um, you know putting his powers together and everything, uh, it related to the younger audience, and it actually worked very well. came off pretty good. Yeah, I thought it was a great idea. It was a, uh, a stroke of genius on your part to, 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 uh, well, to come up with that. Well, some people come up to me. You know, I, I used to meet people when I first when I first did shows like Comic-Cons and stuff, and people would come up and they'd say, oh, my heavens, you actually talk, you know. <laughs> And they and then I and they would come up and say, "My God, you scared the death out of me!" But I loved your character so much, you know. So because it it was like child manner, you know, and it mm-hmm. related to to children. So a lot of a lot of people really embraced that part. It, it worked really well. We got we got really lucky. It worked good. Yeah, that's uh, like I said. It it just it's perfect. For for the film, uh, it really really is, and and you you guys as a trio, you just uh, I think you play off each other very well in in the in both of those. Films. It was a well casted film. I mean, it really. Terrence Stamp is a brilliant actor. Sarah is a, a wonderful actor. I mean, uh, Gene Hackman, forget about it, you know. And, uh, and Chris, <laughs> Chris, they'll never find another Christopher Reeve. Chris, Chris played Superman and Clark Kent so well. 
It just, you know, it was like he was born to do it, you know. He worked out tremendously. And uh, and the whole cast, Valerie Perrine, uh, I mean, Ned Beatty, it was just a, it was a great casting job. And, of course, Donner is Donner. Donner is a brilliant, brilliant director. And it's very yeah. sad that he, he couldn't complete Superman 2 the way he wanted to, but if you see the Donner cut, it's a it's a it's quite a quite quite a good film. Yeah, I have seen it, and uh, I, I I like I, I I like the fact that he knows how to just toe the line where it come between humor and and seriousness. I feel like sometimes Richard Lester took that second film into com- comic uh, comedic yeah, he did. territory Too much. Uh, a little. Yeah, that that would be my complaint, and uh, and uh, and especially he things. He did a few things that were that were aggravating. And I, first of all, Gene Hackman never came back, uh, and and I almost didn't go back. The uh, you know, and, and, if, and Christopher would have stood up and and said you know said something, then the mm-hmm. Donner would have they would have had to use Donner. And it was all about money. The, the salt kinds are just amazing, you know. But I mean, how do you cut? How do you cut Brando out of a picture? Exactly. I mean, they had already paid him. What they didn't want is to pay him the points. You know, <laughs> if he'd done Superman two, they would have had to pay him the points. But Warner Brothers had to pay him when they did the Donner cut anyway. So, you know, he uh, it was. Um, it just you just don't cut Brando out of a picture, especially twenty odd minutes of him, you know. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I know he was famously expensive too, and I'm sure that probably had something to do with their decision, um, you know. But Brando is Brando. I, there's no he's uh, again like right. said, one of a kind. <laughs> he was. Uh, Marlon was Marlon was brilliant. He and I became very good friends. He. Uh, uh, he, he, I, I went down on the set. I used to love to go down and watch him work because he was, when he walked on the set, you could hear a pin drop. And he was, it, he reminded me of, of Mitchum. You know, he's so professional. And, uh, and, he's, and he, he stops and says hello to everybody when he comes in. And he says good night to people when he leaves. Everybody, everyone on, on the crew. And he's, uh, he's just a super guy. And I went down to watch him work one day, and he had cue cards everywhere. I mean, God. And, I, and, I, and I'm sitting there watching him, and I, and I saw him do something I never saw anybody else do before. It was, he was into a scene, and there was a noise or something in the camera, and they said, oh, we got to do it again. And he said, no. And he, he said, just keep that camera rolling. He turned around and turned right back into it and did the scene right away on the spot. And, and it turned out perfect. And, you know, and he, so when he come down off the set, I said to him, you know, I guess a lot of people would be a little bit uh, leery of asking you this, but what's with the cue cards, man? I said, are you, <laughs> are you that bored with the industry that you have to have cue cards everywhere? He said, no, no. He said, I, I, I started that with Mutiny on the Bounty, man. He said, you know, I, I don't want the camera to, to, to feel as though I, I – I knew the lines by heart. I wanted to look like I, I picked them out of the air. And I looked at him and I started to laugh. I said, yo, man. So he, he was a great Shakespearean actor. And he sat there and he ripped off a few parables of Shakespeare, letter perfect. And he looked at me and he said, that you must know word for word. This stuff, piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's just, you know, he's a... Uh, he was he was great. Marlon was Marlon was Marlon was Marlon Brando. I mean, he's just uh, you know working, being able to work with people like that uh, himself and Mitchum and Omar Sharif and uh, Jimmy Coburn and uh, you know and Gene Hackman. You know, I was very fortunate in my career to have worked with some brilliant actors. Yeah, those are and and I you you have worked with some of the best, that's for sure. And uh, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, sadly, and Charlotte Rampling, Charlotte Rampling is a is a is a terrific actor. You know, she was she was brilliant. Uh, it's uh, and the woman, uh, what's her? I got a brain. My brain just went dead. She was nominated for Farewell, My Lovely. Um, Sylvia um, Miles. Right. Yes. 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 She she was, was, she was great. 
Yeah, no, it, it was just, it was, we just, we just had a lot of fun. Harry Dean Stanton was great in that movie. It was, that was another well casted film. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, uh, it's, and that's Mitchum. Everybody loved to work with Mitchum. Like everybody loved to work with Brando. You know, and everybody loved to work with Hackman. I did a picture, March or Die, Hackman and I did, with um, Max Van Cedow and Ian Holm and, uh, and a kid that was an Italian superstar, um, and he was, in fact, his first, I think it was his first American speaking picture. Um, and it was, you know, it just, the industry's a brilliant thing. You have so much fun doing stuff. And, you know, March or Die was, was, was March or Die was a very good film had they not, they shot four hours and tried to edit the film down to an hour and a half out of four hours, and that's kind of tight to do, you know? Yeah, Television but, version, two, two two-hour segments runs extremely well. Yeah, that's that's been the case in a lot of films, unfortunately. And, that, yeah, that's uh, sometimes a film just has to have time to breathe, and uh, yeah. if you don't give it well, time to breathe. As you know, it's uh, a lot of that's up to the director to be able to to put the pace in there so that, you uh, you know, but that's that's Hollywood, you know. Yeah, this is true, and especially if you're a director who doesn't have final cut, that you don't have a lot of say. So I understand in some instances, but uh, yeah, I well, I was going to ask you about, uh, and this is a personal favorite of mine, uh, and it was one of the films that really made me a movie geek, I guess you would call it, uh, King Kong, the 1976 King Kong. I saw it in a the theater when it was released and was it just impressed me i was 6 years old at the time and just i was blown away totally blown away and i so i, um, I had King to Kong had a great cast it was a great script it just had the wrong director but <laughs> um if you'd had uh, a couple other directors that would have directed that that picture would have been so i mean it was just it turned out well as it was because it was a great cast. I mean, it was it, it was Jessica's first picture. You knew she was a star the first day you worked with her. I mean, she was uh, she just had a an incredible presence about her. Mm-hmm. And Jeffrey's a great actor. Uh, Eddie Lauder's a good actor. I mean, it just had we we had a great we had a great cast, and we, and we you know Charlie Grodin was really funny in it. Renee oh, yeah. Bergeron was a great actor, and we, we just we had a lot of fun. You know, we it was a long, long shoot. I think I worked. That was I think that was well. Superman was the longest, but King Kong was next. I think we shot like nine months on Kong. Yeah, I was going to say I believe it started uh, in January of '76 and didn't wrap until August of that year or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was a long it was- shoot. It was a long shoot, you know, because I I know that I I finished uh, Kong, and two weeks later I was in, I was down in Spain doing March or Die. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. uh, then I in March or Die we did all the way up to March, and two weeks later I was over doing Superman. <laughs> so was, well, we just worked went right around the clock. In fact, they they wanted me to do a a television show with. Uh, um, oh God, what's her name? Uh, she did that. Um, oh, my brain's gone dead. Great, great TV show with uh, Lee Majors. Lee oh, Majors uh, was in it. What, Lindsay uh, Wagner? Or? Lindsay yeah, Wagner. Lindsay. Yeah, Lindsay Wagner. They they did the detective show that she did, and they they wanted me to do a double episode on on that show, and you know. So I, I went over to meet the director, and and he called my agent. My agent said he'll he'll come and see you, but don't ask him to read. He doesn't read for people. He just you know, uh, if you want him to do it, he'll do it better than anybody in the business. But don't you know? So I went over and met the guy, and the guy sat there, and he and he and he said I met the producer, and he said, boy, I loved you in Farewell, my lovely, and blah 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 blah. And, I said, good. I said, you know, I said, he said, did you read the script? I said, yeah. I said, uh, um, I, I think it's a, a great role, and, and I'd love to work with Lindsay. I think it would work out well. 
And then the director came in and he said, well, would you read for me? So I read it like a like a magazine article. And he said, no, no. He said, would you read for me? I said, let me ask you a question. Have you enjoyed work that I've done on the screen? He said, oh, my God, farewell, my love. He was brilliant. I said, um, well, here's my take on this here, you know. I said, uh, if you're asking me if I can do this role, I will tell you I'll do it better than anyone in Hollywood. And But I'm not a monkey that you hold up a treat and I dance. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, I, I will do the I will do the role and I'll do it better than anybody else. I said, and, uh, and and thanks for asking me to come over. And he said, you won't read. I said, did my agent explain that to you? He said, yeah, but I thought we could. I said, well, you know, if you liked what you see on the screen with me, then you shouldn't have a problem. And I left. He called my agent. He said, my God, he wouldn't read for me. He said, I told you he wouldn't read. So we didn't hear anything from them, you know. And, and television is mm-hmm. kind of naughty like that. They wait till the very last minute before they they call people in and stuff, you know. So they did that. They called my agent, and they said, well, we're ready for Jack to come over for makeup and wardrobe. And Meyer said, uh, what are you talking about? He said, well, we want him to do... Uh, we want him to do the show with Lindsay. And he said, uh, he's gone. He said, what do you mean he's gone? Well, he's off doing a film. Well, how long is he going to be? He said, well, I don't know, knowing him, probably a year or so. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were in London doing Superman, you know. So, And that's happened a couple times at different uh, shows that I probably – I wasn't really into television that much, but uh, – mm-hmm. There were a couple things that I would have liked to have done that uh, uh, I just, you know, just commitment-wise couldn't. But there's a couple films I should have done. I There was a Clint Eastwood movie I wanted to do, and uh, I just couldn't get the time frame right. And, mm-hmm. You know, so I would love to work with Clint. And uh, so Richard did that picture as well, uh, Pale Rider, I think it was. And um, and mm-hmm. then The Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds. Um, he wanted me to do the role, in the, but I really didn't want to do that role. So it was, again, that playing just a big dumb klutzy guy I wasn't. I wasn't really intrigued with that. So <laughs> yeah. something with a little more range, possibly. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm getting ready to do a picture that I I wrote a script. Oh my heavens, 40 years ago uh-huh. when I was doing King Kong, I wrote a script. They did a picture. I don't know if you if you're a movie buff. There was a picture that was done in the '30s called The Informer. It was a John Ford picture with Victor McLaughlin that won four Oscars. Mm-hmm. It's a, an Irish picture. And I, um, I, I, when I first got into business and and I met with my agent for the first time, Meyer Mishkin, and he looked at me. He said, "Well, what do you want to do in the business?" And I told him. I said, "Well." I'd like to do films like Victor McLaughlin did. And he said, um, because Victor was a great actor. And he said, well, they don't do movies like that anymore. I said, well, you know, I'll just redo The Informer. He said, you're not an actor six months, and already you're going to be a writer and a producer? (laughs) (laughs) So I I researched the film, and uh, uh, I went over and met the writer over in London before he died, Liam O'Flaherty. I mean, and uh, sat down with him, and he told me where the characters came from and everything. He wrote the book. And uh, I uh, sat down, and I uh, went to a library, and I studied uh, several Oscar-winning scripts for format and everything. And I sat down and wrote a script and uh, took it to Mitchum, and he said, I'll do it. And we, we had a plan put together, and... Uh, I didn't like the deal that, that Paramount offered us, so I turned down several deals. And then they were scared of doing the name of the Informer again and comparing it to John Ford. And so we changed the name to Ballad of a Simple Man. And I wrote the song, and uh, Elton John recorded it. And so we've got an Elton John song, and and uh, and we opened up the we op- went to the book and opened up the film a little bit. Better than mm-hmm. the original, and, uh, and it's going to be a pretty good movie. It's uh, we're getting ready. We're going to go shoot it in a few months. 
Oh, that's excellent. I'm excited about that because that was one of my next questions, if you had anything you were working on in particular uh, that you were excited oh, about. We got that. Uh, we're, we're doing that picture, and then I, I've written a book uh, called Family Legacy, which came out extremely well. And, uh, in fact, it's one of a trilogy. I'm getting ready to do the other two. And we're going to do a television series and films out of it. So it's, it's a deal is being put together as we speak, actually. Well, that's great. I'll look forward to that for sure. I, I, I was as, going I mean, to... If you, go to, if you go to the site, uh, familylegacythenovel.com, mm-hmm. hey, you'll see you'll, it's, it's quite... Uh, Quite, quite interesting. It's, uh, it's actually we're we're telling a great story about the country. And my father was rather an infamous guy uh, who came into the country, and he was partners with uh, Meyer Lansky and Chai Luciana mm-hmm. and Frank Costello, and uh, and they were, you know, what no one ever talks about is how all the illicit money that they made back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, they funneled it back into the country. They created a lot of jobs. Mm-hmm. They created a lot of construction jobs. They funded uh, companies like Westinghouse, Sears and Roebuck, uh, insurance companies. Uh, they uh, they were very much involved in the growth of a nation. So we're doing uh, a series that isn't just about organized crime, but it's about how the government, industry, organized crime, and the unions were all partners. For a lot of years, that's a fascinating subject. That's a, and that's a great subject for for uh, for, for yeah. further exploration. I would say for sure because you're right. Uh, so much of uh, the infrastructure that still holds our country together today, I think, was uh, what came out of yep. the the 40s and the 50s. And uh, yep. that, that, hey, that no tells, one really tells the truth about what happened. So it's time to tell the truth about some stuff, you know. So the book yeah. that I wrote. Family Legacy actually tells the truth about the Kennedy assassination. Well, that's that's a subject near and dear to all of our hearts on the show here, I know. So we're all fascinated by that. So uh, you will, read the uh, book and you'll enjoy it. <laughs> we, will, we will be looking forward to that for sure, I I uh, well, I, I was going to ask you about you know some of the things you did, uh, some of the roles you really did regret turning down. I know you mentioned a couple of them. Were there any others that come to mind that you that you regret not being able to take on? Well, you know there was um, I don't know, they 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 came to me one time to do a television thing. They were doing a series, um, and unfortunately it was short lived because they really didn't cast it well. John Belushi was involved, and and I like John a lot. John was crazier than the hoot owl. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, really, really a great loss to comedy. And when he died so young, you know, he was uh, he was just such a brilliant comedian. Mm-hmm. And uh, just that he couldn't, you know, get off that drug stick, you know, and it uh, yeah. and it killed him, which was very sad. You know, it's uh, so many people that escaped from themselves, you know, uh, in ways that, uh, you know, you look at some of the great actors that died young because of situations like that, and, and it's just really sad. You just, uh, makes you, makes your heart hurt. Because yeah. Because some of them yeah, he, terrific talents. Yeah, he, he was, uh, gone way too soon, and, and there's so many projects you hear that he had in the planning stages that never came to fruition, and it makes you wonder where his career would have gone had he lived, you know. That oh, he was he, he, he was just a genius. He was a genius comedian. He really, really was. And, and his brother was a good actor, but he was nothing like, nothing like John. John was, John was unique, you know. And he uh, he and Aykroyd worked very well together. And uh, you know, it's just uh, it, it's just sad. You know, it, it saddens yeah. you when you see people die like that, and it's just uh, way before their time. Yes. Very, very much so. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. He was one of the greats for sure. And uh, yeah, I know he was uh, towards the end. He, oh, his like career he, seemed... Ledger, you know, Ledger was a brilliant actor. I mean, he was just in the twilight. He was just just maturing. You know, yeah. He was just, he was so talented to die that young is just you know so sad. I mean, and a nice kid. He was a really nice kid as well. So. Mm-hmm. 
know, you hate to see things like that happen, but unfortunately, that's life. That's our society. Yeah, yeah, it it, it does happen, unfortunately, and uh, but we thankfully have their work to look back on and can you know those moments frozen in time, as they say. So uh, well, you know, it's often the same thing. He just passed away. And, uh, it was he's another great loss to the industry. Yeah. So it, but you know, the beat goes yep. on. Yeah, there's we we and the losses this year have been really uh, tragic for film fans with uh, uh, the Powers Booth and well, obviously recently Sam Shepard and John Hurd. We had on we had him on our show last year, and uh, just he's you know it's it's it's. It's it's hard to see those things happen. Sam Shepard was such a nice guy, man, and so talented. Jeez, he was a talented guy. He really was a talented guy, and it was sad to see him die. But you know, yeah, so unassuming. Uh, just seemed like a just a, a a regular guy. He came across that way anyway. That was his persona, and uh, he he just seemed like just just a just a great guy from what uh, I've well, he was heard. I mean, he lived out in New Mexico he wasn't into the mm-hmm. Hollywood deal he, he but he was so talented as a writer you know he mm-hmm. wrote some great stuff and he did some great stuff on stage and you know he was just just a good actor he was but he was a nice person you know he was just a nice person yeah and to be able to write that many plays it's it's amazing to <laughs> people don't realize how prolific he was too so yeah. Hey, one quick story before we go. You know, sure, yeah. I would love to. Ever, did you like Omar Sharif? I loved him. We all did, yep. Omar Sharif was one of the funniest guys. He, we we did the Baltimore Bullet together mm-hmm. with Jimmy Coburn and uh, uh, and, and Omar. Omar is a gambling – he was a gambling degenerate. He loved gambling. And he, and he actually was one of the best bridge players in the world. Mm-hmm. He was a world-class bridge player and backgammon player, and he actually invented the very first uh, backgammon board game for you know computerization, right? So we yeah come on the set and we had every pool hustler in the country that was on the Baltimore Bullet because it was about the nine ball tournament. So Moscone, everybody was there. All the every pool hustler from Detroit, Chicago, they were all in the movie. And they were drooling, waiting for Omar Sharif to come on the set. And he said, he goes on to get his makeup check, and, and he had just got off the plane. And these guys surrounded him. Oh, man, how you doing? Jeez, we've been waiting for you. About it out. He said, waiting for me for what? Well, we thought we'd play a little backgammon. He said, guys, I just got here. Can we just, can I get a cup of coffee or something before? So I'm sitting in the chair next to him, and he, he said, and he's laughing like a devil. And I said, what, what's so comical? He said, Jack, you got to come and watch this. This is going to be good. Just come over here and watch this with me. And he's he going over and sat down with these guys. And they were all drooling, waiting to play him. And he said, well, guys, what, what are we playing for? And they said, well, we thought we'd make it easy on you, maybe $50 a point. So he said, well, why not 500 a point? <laughs> <laughs> and I never saw anybody spin a cube so quick. He took thirty grand off these guys before you could write your name. <laughs> just, just fleeced them, man. I said I laughed like. A, hey, he's walking away. And he smiled and he said, "Well, I tell you, I wish I could do that every day." <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was that's great. Such a, such a super guy. And, you know, we're down in New Orleans and we're sitting in a restaurant having mm-hmm. breakfast. These women are lined up outside down the street and and waiting for him to come out of the out of the restaurant. I said, Wow man, I said, You have this problem all the time? He said, Stick around. He said, This is this is nothing. He said, Just stick around a while. It's just the people are crackers, man. It's, <laughs> people just you know but he was just he was such a such a, a nice, nice guy. Right. They have him down and labeled as the, the Romeo of Egypt, you know? It was <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I may get you to tell a Steve McQueen story since you did know him uh, very quickly before was, we go. He, McQueen was McQueen was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. I mean, he's really a super – you know, I just uh, – he, um, he loves speed. 
and he, he and he loved. He was very kind to people. He, mm-hmm. he spent a lot of time out with the Indians and bought them trucks and stuff. And he was a very giving man. Uh, but he was like a he was like a big kid that never grew up. You know, I mean, I felt mm-hmm. bad. His wife Nell is such a wonderful woman, just such a lovely, lovely person. And she gave up a great career to come to Hollywood with him. She was a great stage mm-hmm. actress. And uh, you know, and he and he. He had a party at his house one weekend, and, and Ali McGraw came, and he left with Ali McGraw. I said, <laughs> do you not know how to say no? He said no. <laughs> he, he, he was like a big kid. You know, he's just, and he's such a great actor. And he's one of the few actors that really made the transition over from television to film as well as he did, you know. And he did the Great Escape movie. He did the driving on the motorcycle. He did his driving and the guy chasing him. Oh, that's fascinating. I had I, that I did not know. He did his driving and the guy chasing him. He did both of them. He was uh, he just loved speed. He loved motorcycles. He loved cars. He did, you know he did every he did that movie with Ali, uh, The Great Escape or something with a car, and he, and he did all the driving in that. He wouldn't dare let anybody else get in the car. He was, I said, man, you got a death wish? He said, no, man, it's just, you know, you got to make it real. He said, well, you're doing that, son. Don't worry about it. He was uh, <laughs> just one of the good guys of Hollywood. Another guy died way too young, way oh, too young. What a tragedy that was. I, I can remember yeah. when that happened, and I was just, it was just shocking, just absolutely shocking uh, that he, he passed so soon because he was really still at the top of his game, and I think he would have continued to. Oh, God, to. yeah, I mean, he had just won the Oscar for Sand Pebbles, which was an amazing movie. I mean, he was. Yeah. But he was and good I'm in everything big... he ever did. Thomas Crown Affair was brilliant. I mean, he was it just. It is. Everything he did, he touched, was just, you know, just, he was just that key, just a real. He, he was like Mitchum. Mitchum was the same way. Mitchum was probably the most underrated American actor that ever got on a screen. You know, he was. Robert did some incredible films, and so did Steve. You know, Steve was, Steve, and Steve was just a good guy. He was just a, a good all-around person, and I had a lot yeah. of time for him. I liked him a lot. Yeah, he. I. I I'm just like you said. I'm sorry that he was uh, taken so soon because it, it would have been really great to see what he what he would have eventually done. And I was always a big fan of the Towering Inferno as a kid as well. And uh, I always remember the story that I heard that he and Paul Newman were arguing about who would get top billing, and they so they put both of their names on screen with Paul Newman's name being slightly higher on the uh, on the on the credits. But they appear at the same time on screen. Their their names do, which was I thought was a hilarious story that they uh, they had to work that out between them. Paul, so. Paul 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 was a nice guy, a bit of a he had a little bit of an ego factor, but he was uh, another good actor. I mean, another another nice guy. I mean, his brother was the first AD on on the Baltimore Bullet, so Paul used to come down on the set all the time because. He was a pretty good pool player, mm-hmm. and he loved coming down and shooting pool with Moscone. And Jimmy Coburn could shoot a pretty good stick, and so did actually so did Omar. Omar wasn't a bad ball pool player either. So we had a lot of fun doing that. A lot of people, <laughs> and you know, Paul came down, got to know Paul pretty well, and he was a race car freak. He loved oh, race yeah. cars. Love racing, yeah, I, drinking beer all the time. I said, "How do you stay so skinny, man? Every time I see you, you got a beer in your hand." <laughs> Love drinking beer. And his wife uh, was such a nice woman. I mean, he married that woman for his whole life. You know, he's yep, yep, long uh, time. That's one of the rare he, marriages that lasted in Hollywood. Oh, he was, sure. just, he, he was just he was he was he you know he had the he had the bluest eyes you ever seen. I mean, you, you couldn't. <laughs> When I remember the first time, and I, and I couldn't believe when I first met him, he was so small, you know. <laughs> I said, I thought you were a lot bigger. Said, yeah, everybody does. He was, <laughs> the, I mean, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was was a great, great film. He did so many great films. Oh, yeah, he was, definitely. He was, he was a great actor. I would have loved to have done a picture with him. In fact, I'd like to do a picture with Bobby Redford. He's another great actor. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and a good director as well. He's he's oh, he's just a his, talented guy. Yeah. Very very talented guy. Yeah, it's yeah. He's uh, I I still think Ordinary People is is one of the the better films of the last probably forty years uh, for sure. But but uh, yeah, very quickly before we before I do go, I, I wanted to ask you what your opinions are on the state of the movie business these days because it's certainly different than it was when you were. Uh, coming up in the 60s and 70s, and uh, it's just it has not... to be given back to the creative people. You know, the problem with the industry, the problem with the industry today is that it's run by MBAs, and they have no clue. They have no, all they care about is their quarterly reports. They have no vision, and they just uh, they they they're always trying to make deals to to do pictures in this place where there's a tax deal or that place and. And they wind up tearing pages out of scripts to make the budgets work and stuff. And there's too many pictures that, and they're remaking too much stuff because they 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 let great scripts go by. They just don't know what they're reading. You yeah, know? I agree. And it's all about the bottom line. I, I, I'm very disturbed because I feel like uh, they they want to just repeat prior successes and not take any chances. And we all know that great art has to come with some sort of risk. And I don't feel uh, like the, there's the risk involved that uh, n- there needs to be. I, you know, personally, I don't want to see. I, I, I don't mind a superhero film every now and then, but when that's all we're getting, it's like a constant diet uh, of candy. They're and trying to make, they're trying to make what they think is blockbusters, and they forgot how to make good films. You understand? They, exactly. they, they don't have the creativity. They need to give. They need to give the industry back to the creative people. That's what they need to do. They need to they need to let the creative people take the industry back, and that's why so many good actors are doing independent film companies. They're doing their own movies because they just don't want to get caught up in, you know. And hopefully, there's a couple changes that are going to happen. I think that hopefully will help 